Now let's compare this to a more traditional painting of the same type of a scene, done at about the same time. The upper picture, which is not really very noteworthy, is kind of a panoramic picture of people at a racetrack. And there's little groupings of people, and people pretty solid throughout this, and there's little things going on. There's a fellow here sort of hamming things up, maybe for the benefit of this small child. There's two people together here. There's folks doing things here. It's a lot of little scenes put together, and there's a lot of detail here. And with the, the racetrack building here in the background, it pretty well tells its story. So this sits there, and we can take it in, and it's almost like a photograph of the scene. But Manet's drawing here of the races couldn't be duplicated by a camera because he's interpreting for us his impression of the scene, and he's highlighting things that form that impression for him. So this is where the artist is departing from just the painting as somebody expected it to be. Now, it's my contention that one of the reasons that the type of painting you see in the upper illustration fell out of favor, and the kind of drawing style that you see at the bottom took prominence is that about this time photography was commercialized and it started to become pretty apparent to people that if you wanted the result that you see in the upper part of this slide you can take a picture of it not a color picture at that time but a likeness that was mechanically produced so that it really was the way it was and if that was your intention you really didn't need an artist to create that but the artist at the bottom, Manet, in creating this sketch, gave you something that you couldn't take a picture of. And it was very unique. What are the contributing influences for this change in the direction of art and what the artist felt they should do? Well, one of them was a rather interesting kind of a, an effect. There were articles manufactured in Japan that were being shipped into France at this time. Trade with Japan had opened up. And some of these were wrapped up in paper that had woodblock prints on them. Just because the paper had been printed that way, and then it happened to be used to wrap up ceramic objects that were sent in crates to France. And people started looking at these, and the formation of the subject matter here was far different than the rules followed by the Academy. In this case, you'll notice there's two lines here. There's the line of this pole that's holding up this pulley, there's the line of the rope, and those are kind of mimicking the shape of this mountain, Mount Fuji. That kind of composition of an artwork was unheard of for the Academy. If your intention was to picture the mountain, it would be the dominant part of the scene. Hiding it behind a pole like this seemed to be a composition that violated rules of how a picture should be formed. This might have influenced some artists to start considering different ways of composing paintings. They probably had some ideas already, but this tended to support their ideas. And also the development of the camera. In this unit, I've had you do some reading about the history of photography. It ties right in with this era because photography was invented in 1839 in a rather crude way, a way that worked but was dangerous to use and cumbersome. But within 20 years it was refined to the point where people such as this man up here in the upper left corner could carry equipment that used wet negative plates out to the field somewhere and take pictures. And that equipment was refined. Here is perhaps a similar type of a camera adjustable bellows so that the focus could be adjusted and this might have sat on a tripod because it was a little bit too heavy to carry but by the 1890s George Eastman had invented a way to have dry film in a small box and here's Eastman himself taking a photograph with this, this small type of a camera which could be mass produced and was mass produced and people could take some of their own pictures take a look down here in the lower left if what you wanted was portraiture that was now available to the common man, and everybody could have a likeness exactly as it was. You didn't need to hire an artist to do this anymore. Now, that didn't diminish entirely the need for portraiture, because these initial photographs could only be black and white, but it opened up the whole idea that if you wanted a likeness of somebody, it was available without an artist. As people started taking pictures, the artful composition of pictures also became possible. Take a look at this one in the middle of looking down this roadway towards this castle at the end. Or this rather artfully composed picture 
with light streaming in at a train station and people walking through. It's very dramatic. So photography began to take on its own life as an art form, and the subject matter that photography was good for, the question arose. Perhaps photography was a better way to do this than an artist doing it. And I think some artists probably felt that, well, if their efforts could be replicated by a camera, what good were the efforts? Wouldn't it be better if they would express themselves in a way that they interpreted the scene, their impression of the scene, so that they actually do become more of a poet in a visual sense than somebody who just simply tried to replicate with as much detail as possible something that the camera could do as well. So let's take a look at a comparison between academic art and Impressionism. And probably the biggest single difference is the way that light is treated. So on the left we have with the Valpissant Bather by Jean Angra, we have studio lighting. No harsh shadows, everything very finely done. The right hand side with Wenoir, we have this scene outside and it's kind of an extreme example of the way that light would not be controlled. Here we have sunlight streaming through the branches and the boughs of the tree and it presents this mottled appearance. People are not evenly lit and you'll notice several examples of this. The most prominent one is this young lady whose face is kind of covered with shadow in this part and shadows on part of her dress but lighter parts elsewhere. This sort of lighting initially was offensive to people. Art critics would look at this and say, well, this is just an impression of how this person saw it, and that's where the name came from, Impressionism. But it added something to the picture that you couldn't get with a photograph, and that, I think, was the secret of it. Here we have Manet. This is a kind of an interesting little play on words here. Manet was an early painter. He was active even before the Impressionist era began. A friend of his, Claude Monet, whose name is spelled very similarly, arrived later on the scene and lived much longer. Monet lived into the 1920s. But here we have Edouard Manet doing an Impressionist painting of his friend Monet, who was carrying his plein air work out onto a boat that he had fixed up as a little art studio so that he could capture the action from the water. And you see here a number of examples of the techniques of Impressionist painting. First of all, there's a fuzziness to it. It's not exact, and the brush strokes are rather crude. You saw some brush strokes like this even with Rembrandt, but that was the exception rather than the rule. And here everything looks crude. In fact, some people would have initially called this kind of a sketch for a piece of art, but not a finished piece. But it was a finished piece in the mind of these artists.